is uh, just such a wonderful spirit and a tremendous sense of of chevreshaf that I feel and wanted to really thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I wanted to also take this opportunity to invite one and all, if you're ever on the East Coast, uh, to join us at our synagogue, which we call the Bayit, the house, the home. And please feel so very welcome to come on Shabbat, part of Shabbat. It would be our great, great honor and great pleasure. And in the same breath, please feel welcome to join us in Riverdale to come into our Bet Midrash, into Yeshivat Chovevei Torah. As Judith was speaking this morning, and you spoke about some contacts with Chovevei students, you brought tears to my eyes. The students at Chovevei, they're not my sons, but they're like my sons. And I love them dearly. Rabbi Jason Weiner is here, who is the senior rabbi at Cedar Sinai and has done extraordinary, extraordinary work. And in so many ways, Jason and the others, Aaron Lerner, who now is going to be the Jim Joseph educator at UCLA, and many others, they have become my teachers. And something very important to me, separate and independent of Chovevei, Yeshivat Maharat, which is a school that trains women to become halachic decisors, who trains women to become spiritual leaders within the Orthodox community, which, whose dean is Sarah Horowitz, who serves on full-time on our rabbinic staff at the Bayit. I also welcome you to come and to visit Yeshivat Maharat. Three women are going to graduate, God willing, this coming June, and will become full members of the clergy. It's a, it's a wonderful time for me personally and for these institutions. I did want to mention, although he's not here, my dear, dear friend, Rabbi Yosef Kinevsky, who is playing a critical role in the development of the International Rabbinic Fellowship, which is a group of now over 200 modern, what I call open Orthodox rabbis, for whom the spirit of pluralism, these kinds of organizations are so central rabbis from across the country, and I'm so grateful to Yosef for all that he has done. And again, I thank you for your kindness and for your, for your welcome. It's hard for me to teach unless we first sing, and I thought that maybe it's a good idea. Song is really the gateway. So this is a wonderful uh, nigun, well-known, that was composed by Rib Shlomo, and please join me. Lemana chai ai Adabra na Adabra na Shalom Because of our brothers and friends Because of our sisters and Friends, please let me sing, please let me say peace to you. This is the house, the house of the Lord. I wish the best for you. What's the difference between heaven and hell? I mean, after all, in hell they also sing. And he would say, ah, the difference is, but in heaven when you sing, you sing with harmony. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> I 
as spiritual leaders, a term that I actually prefer, preparation for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur not only involves carefully crafting inspiring talks, but the greatest preparation involves to spiritually prepare ourselves. The key to inspiring others, the most important foundation, is to be inspired oneself. You can't inspire unless one is inspired. And that is what Chodesh Elul is about. Ein Kedusha B'li HaChana, said Rabbi Soloveitchik, there's no holiness with that preparation. And so in this second seminar, we'll try to offer some thoughts which may modestly help us in this preparation. We begin with an analysis of some of the goals of tefillah. After all, we're going to be spending so much time in tefillah on the yamim Noraim. If you'll turn, please, to page 13 in the handouts, there are two primary sources for prayer. The first is the position of Maimonides, who writes, it is an affirmative commandment to pray every day. And now I'm in the third line. Serve him, uppercase, serve God with all your hearts. Amru Chachamim, the sages said, Ezohi Avodashe Balev, what is the service of the heart? Zot <coughs> This is prayer. Now, while this term, Le Avdo, we read it in last week's parsha, <coughs> while Le Avdo Becholevavachem is normatively understood to mean to serve him. Let's try to offer another suggestion. La'avdo could also mean to work with him. La'avdo may not be a compound of la'avod oto, but rather la'avod ito. It can be so vocalized. Dear colleagues, chavirim and chavirot, I draw your attention to the words in the Joseph story, when the Torah says, Velo yachlu dabro lishalom. The brothers could not speak with him in peace. So explains the Midrash. So says Rashi. Lidabro means lidaber imo. It's not that la'avdo does not mean to serve him. It does mean la'avod oto. But there's a rainbow and there's an arch. And la avod oto could arch into la avod ito to work with God. This then can have reference to the covenantal responsibility to partner with God, to bring staka umishpat into, into this world, to do this with all of our hearts. Could that be the Maimonidean approach to prayer? <clears throat> Le'avdo, not only to serve him, but to work with God, with all of our hearts, to work covenantly, to partner with God, to redeem the Jewish people, and ultimately to redeem the entire world. Samson Rafael Hirsch of the 19th century Frankfurt Amen makes this point when he says that the word hitpalel to pray comes from the root palal. Hitpalal be from which tefillah is derived, originally meant to deliver an opinion about oneself, to judge oneself. Thus, it denotes to step out of active life in order to attempt to gain a true judgment about oneself. That is about one's ego about one's relationship to God and the world. That sentence is worth the price of admission. It really summarizes the direction, the vectors of prayer about one's ego turning inward 
relationship to God upward and the world, that's the horizontal movement. Accordingly, you should at times tear yourself loose from the existence which endangers your true life and strive in tefillah to renew your strength for life and regain your right and your will for truth, <coughs> righteousness, and love, as well as the power and the courage for victorious battle. Now, Chevra, open your hearts. From this perspective, prayer is not only what God does for us, but our responsibility to do for God, our people, all people, humankind. If you look at the prayer, which is most often said in public prayer, in public tefillah, I believe it carries that message. The prayer that is most often said is the prayer of the reader, the Chatzit Kaddish, the half Kaddish. It's a good example of this kind of prayer. The key word in the Kaddish, in the Chatzit Kaddish, the word that is most often repeated is Shmei. It kadel it kadesh. Shmei Rabbah. Yehei Shmei Rabbah Mavarach. Yitbarech v'yishtabach v'yitpa'e v'yitromam v'yitnaseh v'yitada v'yitale v'yitalal Shmei Dekutsha. Even in Kaddish Shalem, Shmaya sounds like shame. Shame Hashem. Shmei. Shmei is a compound of the name of God, Shem Hashem. And Shem Hashem is the code word for bringing the mission of God, the mission of Judaism into the world. When Abraham and Sarah build that altar, Vayikra Sham B'Shem Hashem, and they called out in the name of God. Whenever one sees the word Shmei, it means to bring ethical monotheism into the world. And so when the reader recites the Kaddish and we respond Amen, this is what we're really saying. Yitkadil Yitkadesh Shmei Rabbah. May we, people, do our share to magnify and sanctify God's name by bringing ethical monotheism into the world. I want to repeat that. May we, people, us, do our share to magnify and sanctify Yitkadil Yitkadish, the name of God, Shmei Rabbah, by bringing the Shem Hashem, by bringing the mission of Judaism, by bringing Shmei Rabbah, ethical monotheism, into the world. And the reason why the Kaddish is so often said is that it concludes each subsection of the prayer, even as the Kaddish Shalim concludes the entire prayer service. It's like the refrain. It is those lines that are repeated over and over. From this perspective, Prayer is a form of assumption of responsibility. This is prayer as responsibility. A very counterintuitive idea. Stop the average person in the street, ask them what prayer is about, they'll say, prayer is about what we hope God will do for us. We're suggesting that Maimonidean prayer is also what we're expected to do for God for our people, for all of humankind. <clears throat> There's an opposite approach, I believe, <clears throat> and that is the approach <clears throat> of Nachmanides, of Ramban. Writes Ramban 2a, Shenipalil elav be'et hatsarot. We should pray to God in times of distress, v'tiyena einenu v'libenu elav levado, k'inei avadim el yada donehem that our eyes and hearts be directed towards him like servants in the hands of their masters. Two lines from the bottom. This is the commandment that in distress, we should call out to God. We should cry out to God. Now this is taking prayer from a very different perspective. A dear friend, Rabbi Ed Feld, who edited the conservative Marso that was recently published. We were on a panel discussion at the seminary and he said something that touched me very, very deeply. He offered a different interpretation for the word palal, which I think very, very much fits into this Nachmanidean approach. 
the Nachmanidin approaches that in times of distress we recognize that we are part of a bigger world and there are times we have to be fully and completely reliant upon God. And so this is what he said as I remember it. An alternative meaning, halal, according to Rabbi Edfeld, can also mean hope. As when Jacob, after many years of separation from Joseph, finally sees his sons and says these words, Re'ei fanecha, Jacob says to Joseph, Behold your face, lofi lofi. I never gave up hope. I never gave up hope, Gilad, that one day we would be able to see him. Never gave up hope. Re'ei fanecha lo filalti. On a deeper level, could it be suggested that the word panecha, re'ei panecha, may refer to God? In this reading, Jacob is proclaiming to God, re'ei fanecha, because, O oh God, I feel your presence by seeing your face, by being reliant upon you, and certain of your, of your love, concern, and support, O oh God. Re'ei fanecha, lo filoti, O oh God, I never, ever lost hope. <coughs> if you'll turn to see. Note, just going back to B for a moment and to A, that Nachmanides' emphasis, his last word, is on our calling out to God. The emphasis for Nachmanides is not on God's response. It's on our calling out to God. Acceptance is not the fundamental goal of prayer. Forging an intimate relationship with God is its centerpiece. When we talk about reliance upon God, the Nachmanidean idea that in distress I lean on God, he's not talking about and God responding affirmatively to our request. We call out to God. We call out to God. If you'll take a look at the second paragraph, C, page 14, these words are some of the most wonderful words I've ever written on prayer. When man or woman is in need and prayer and praise, God listens. One of God's attributes is Shomeat Vilai, he who listens to prayer. Let us note that Judaism has never promised that God accepts all prayer. Now the next paragraph has carried me many, many times in difficult moments. Acceptance of prayer is a hope, a vision, a wish, a petition but not a principle or a premise. The foundation of prayer is not the conviction of its effectiveness. As I say this to you, I really feel chills up my spine. The foundation of prayer is not the conviction of its effectiveness, but the, the belief that through it we approach God intimately and the miraculous community embracing finite human being and his creator is born. The basic function of prayer is not its practical consequences, but the metaphysical formation of a fellowship consisting of God and man, of God and woman. Eliezer Berkowitz, Mori Verabi of blessed memory, he says it this way. This is what he says a prayer about prayer. It is like the child running to the mother because it hurts. It is not the bandage that the child seeks instinctively but the nearness of the mother to unburden his heart to the one of whose love he is absolutely certain. A good example in the prayer service of this of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is a lesser known prayer, but a beautiful prayer. Ochila lakel achale panav. I pray to God, I entreat him. Eshalami menu ma'ne lashon. I request of God the gift of language, understanding of language. This is not prayer, as Maimonides would say, as responsibility, but this is prayer as reliance. Maimonides, 
prayer as responsibility. Nachmanides, prayer as reliance. Now, while prayer as responsibility and reliance seem to be opposite, they have a commonality. And what they have in common, in common is that both deal with what I think is the primary centerpiece of prayer, and that is feeling God's presence. Feeling God's presence can inspire one to be godlike and covenantly assume responsibility. And feeling God's presence can inspire one to recognize finitude and dependence upon God. Thus, perhaps, tefillah can be associated with another word, not just the palal of responsibility and the palal of reliance, but tefillah from the word nafal, I fall before you, O God. And in this sense, the mission of Judaism, which is to bring God into the world, dovetails with the essential motif of tefillah to feel God's presence. Mori Rabbi, for the last 10, 15 years, was the great Rabbi Yehuda Amital of blessed memory, one of the real greats. He understood that tshuva, in its most fundamental sense, is v'li Yerushalayim yirchabe rachamim tashuv, return, return to your homeland, return to Israel. It was my custom, he was such an encouraging force as we started Chovave, I always would go to his home for his words of encouragement, and before I would leave, I would say, Rav Yehuda, Devar Torah. And he became sick, and his wife was kind enough to allow me to, to visit him. And we sat, and he was so weak. And I looked at him and I said, Mariv Rabbi, I know you're not up to a Devar Torah, aval Mila, Rak Mila, just a word. Google his name just to give you the context of, of his response. And this Rabbi Huda Amital, such a trailblazer, unbelievable force of social justice and commitment to Am Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael. He, in one of my great moments, took my hand in both of his hands and he looked into my eyes and he said, Avraham, ikar ha'emuna. The main thing is to believe coming from a man who had done so much in his life that was extraordinary. Another thought to consider as we prepare ourselves so spiritually to turn to page 15, something I'm thinking about, talking about this Yom Kippur, which I call so close and, and yet so far. Unplugging. There's a, a movement that's gaining traction around the world that one day a year, some people are suggesting uh, maybe one day a month. Others are suggesting uh, one day a week. Sound familiar? <laughs> that uh, we should unplug, unplug. Unplug from Facebook, unplug from Twitter, <coughs> unplug from email. And what I'd like to share in this uh, particular thought is what is the concern that is driving this unplugging movement? And does Judaism offer any response to this, this concern? Now, Rosh Hashanah is Yom Harat Olam. Rosh Hashanah is the day when God created the world. Let's take a look on page 15 in number 1a. In Genesis 1, Breshit Aleph, this is the way God created the world. God created Ha'adam which I do not believe means the man. There are certain words that can't be translated. It's not even Adam, it's Ha'adam. This being was created Zachar Unikeva. If you'll take a look at, at 2a, Amar Rav Shmuel Bar Nachman in Eruvim, B'Shah Shebaroh HaKadosh Baruch Hu Et Adam HaRishon, when God first created Adam, Right at the onset of Genesis chapter one, do you part sufim brao? He created him double-faced. What Rabbi Soloveitchik calls Adam one. Adam one was one being, male and female, male features and female features, K 
connected, but they were connected in such a way you couldn't get closer, but their faces did not turn inward, their faces turned outward. Think about it. Someone is behind me, we're as connected as we can be, but we're looking outward. That's Adam 1. Adam 1. Now look at 1b. Genesis 2. Which is normatively understood that man comes from, that woman comes from the eve of man. Says the Gemara in Eruvim, that last line in 2a, Unisaro va'asao gabayim. Tsela, as you can see in 2b, need not mean rib. Tsela could mean side. Mistarav, kmo ulitsela, mistarav, kmo ulitsela, hamishkan. Unisaro va'asa o gabayin. Adam 2, God splits that one being, and they're male and female independent, but they're able to turn around and face each other. And so, Rabbi Soloveitchik, in his magnificent, lonely man of faith, writes, that there are two realms. There is a realm of, of being alone. Alone is a physical state of being by oneself. Loneliness is a, meta, is a metaphysical state. I can share a home, I could share a room, I can share a bed with someone. I may not be alone, but I could be desperately, desperately lonely. Adam one is Genesis 1, sentence 27. Zachah unikeva. They were not alone. They were back to back. They were so absolutely close. And yet they were so far. Although not alone, they're lonely. Hence, Adam 2, the bifurcation, facing each other, showing the inner existential, the inner existential selves. Yes. The internet has brought us closer together, but often it has been in Adam One style. How many friends on Facebook are really friends? And Twitter, it has its great positives, but those short sound bites, if you're not careful, they can really hurt. And finally, email with all of its positives <laughs> is a one-dimensional form of connecting that can often be so painful. Communication should be with voice, even best face to face. So as positive and as important as email can be, like everything that has greatness, it has its vulnerabilities. Ironically, the internet with all of its positive has brought us, with, with all of its positives of bringing us closer together, has driven us further apart much like the lonely, lonely person wandering through that crowded room. And so people are unplugging. They're seeking an Adam to relationship, the ones that are more real. Relationships wherein we are not only talking to each other, but as Paul Simon wrote, but we're speaking to each other. Relationships where we're not only hearing each other, we're listening to each other. We're not only seeing, but we're empathizing. We're not only touching, but we're feeling. Relationships when we are not only, as Rabbi Soloveitchik writes about Adam 1, working partners, but we are Adam 2. We are existential friends. On its most basic level, that is the message especially of Yom Kippur, the Shabbat Shabbaton. The Torah declares when it talks about Shabbat, Vayichal Elohim Bayom Hashri'i, and God finished his work on the seventh day. In other words, God was creating on the seventh day. He finished his work on the seventh day. What was his work on the seventh day? Open your hearts. Open your hearts. Whereas for six days, God, and in emulating God, we work on the outer world. Shabbat is the day to unplug, to work on the inner world. 
Whereas for six days we stress existence, on Shabbat we should be stressing essence. Whereas for six days we emphasize, as Abraham Heschel wrote, having more, on Shabbat we should be emphasizing being more. As he brilliantly wrote in the Sabbath, to have more does not mean to be more. It's that extraordinary, extraordinary statement in Midrash. As we run, we lose our sight. But Ben Hashmashot, as Shabbat comes, we regain our vision. Running during the week, we lose our sight. We pass each other in the night. But as Shabbat comes and we step back, we can, we can forget. Taking large steps, the Medrash says, reduces the person's vision. As the Ramah, the codifier of Ashkenazic law, writes in Orachayim, he says, at Kiddush, look at the candle lights. With the candle lights looking at them, we regain the vision, which is the ultimate message of Shabbat. Dear colleagues and friends, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur have many messages, many messages, social justice messages, messages relating to Israel, messages relating to contemporary norms, contemporary dreams and wishes. But I believe that on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we can talk about some of the basics, and amongst them is Shabbat. It's Shabbat, it's that bumper sticker which reads, hang in there, Shabbat is coming. The world needs that day of unplugging. The world needs Shabbat for ourselves, for Israel, the Kol Yishvei Tevel. It's that Reb Shlomo Nigun, the whole world is waiting to sing the song of Shabbos. This is the way I hope to end the dress this year. The mountains, does it get better than this? And the valleys, sing the song of Shabbos. Abraham taught Isaac to sing the song of Shabbos. Sarah taught Rebecca sing the song of Shabbos. Face one another. Sing the song of Shabbos. Mizimo, Mizimo, she. And a final, a final thought about creating spiritual moments. If you'll turn, please, to page 17. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are days of spiritual striving. For the past five years, I've been working on a book which hopefully will be published in the coming months. Believe me, it's a very inadequate, humble effort. It's called Holistic Prayer, a Guide to Jewish Spirituality. And in it, I try to be one of thousands of people to explore spirituality. And I offer this definition. For me, spirituality means being conscious of the moment while feeling the presence of God. Being in the moment with God. And being in the moment is so important as we as spiritual leaders prepare for Shabbat and teaching the message of being in the moment is a major theme, I believe, of the Yamim Nora'i. On the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah, we always read the portion of Nitzavim. Atem Nitzavim Hayom. You're standing today. And in most denominational services, the service ends with that song. Hayom, Hayom, Hayom. Hayom, Hayom. We live in a world where many people are immobilized by the past and anxious about the future. And in the process, they fail to live in the present. We sing about yesterday and we sing about 
tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, but not enough about today. In life cycle events, I always turn to bride and groom, to the parents, and I say the following. Most people at these events, they're always waiting for the next moment. Either they're worried about the way it will happen, or they're so excited about it, that's all they're thinking about. Most of us, when we talk to each other, we're looking over the shoulders and looking for the next person we're going to talk to. And so what I say to the celebrants is, whatever you're doing, live in the moment, hold it tight, be in that moment. And Yom Kippur offers a ritual to achieve this goal. It's a radical ritual. On that day, we step back from all of life energy. For many Jews on Yom Kippur, we don't eat, we don't drink. Cohabitation is avoided. We, in effect, simulate death. We take a step back to have a brush with death to better appreciate life, every moment of life. I'm on page 17, 1a. Says the Gemara, Maye Ovid Inish What should a person do to live? Answers the Gemara, Yamitat let him mortify himself, kill himself with study and hard work. I'd like to take it a bit differently. Maye Ovid Inish What should a person do to live? Yamitat Smo. Imagine this is the last moment. Don't imagine it's the last moment and to wear it like a yoke on our shoulders so that we can't function. But imagine it's the last moment in the sense of making every moment of life a quality moment. It's the Rebbe who turns to his students and says, Kindalach, children, don't worry. No matter what you've done, if at the last moment of your life you do tshuva, you'll be accepted upstairs in the Garden of Eden. And everybody ran to the bimbos, as we would say in my old yeshiva days, until there was one very bright student who said, Rebbe, you save at the last moment if we repent. All is well, but I have one question. When is the last moment? And the Rebbe said, ah, live every moment as if it's your last. Not in the sense of feeling the burden, God forbid, of dying, but to qualify, to live, to, to make every moment a quality moment. As the Ibn Ezra writes, Adam doeg alibud damav ve'ino doeg alibud yamav. I love this. Damav chuzrim, yamav enam chuzrim. You're worried about money, not days. Money you can get back. A day gone, I can tell you this as I get older, I feel this more and more, is a day one is never, ever going to be had back. It said most beautifully, in Thornton Wilder's Our Town. You remember the play. <coughs> Emily dies too young and is allowed to, re, to, is, to revisit one day in her life. And she decides she wants to revisit her 12th birthday. And in the play, she's able to see herself. It's like the soul. She's able to see herself, but she could not be seen as she re-experiences the 12th birthday. Look at number two. This is what she says. Oh, Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone by. I'm dead. You're a grandmother, Mama. I married George Gibbs, Mama. Wally's dead, too. His appendix burst on the camping trip to North Conway. We felt just terribly, terrible about it. Don't you remember? But just for a moment now, we're all together. Mama, just for a moment. We're happy. Let's look at one another. And then she says, I can't. I can't go on. It goes so fast. We don't have time to look at one another. I didn't realize. I didn't realize. So all that was going on, and we never noticed, take me back up the hill to my grave. But first, wait. One more look. Goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners, Mom and Papa. Goodbye to clocks ticking and Mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and new iron dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute.
minute. Now here, open your hearts, spirituality takes a counterintuitive turn. While spirituality is being conscious of the moment, being in the moment, holding on to the moment, we should recognize that we shouldn't hold the moment too tight. Inevitably, it will pass. Look at these beautiful words of Milton Steinberg. Nothing can be more grotesque and more undignified than a futile attempt to hold on. Let us think of the men and women who cannot grow old gracefully because they cling too hard to a youth which is escaping them, of parents who cannot let their children go free to live their own lives. This then is the great truth of human existence. One must not hold life too precious. One must always be prepared to let it go. Do you know what Steinberg calls this? He calls this to embrace with open arms. I love that phrase. It's the blessing I didn't want to say when our daughters were bat benot mitzvah and our son was bar mitzvah baruch shep tarani. It's much easier to hold on in love, much tougher to let go. It's that mirachefet, God hovering. When you hover, you're not crushing the eggs. You're protecting, but you're giving space. You're in the moment, but you're holding the moment loosely to embrace to hold with open arms. No, really open your hearts. I wish we had more time, and I forgot to put this quote here. So how could you do them both at the same time? How could you hold on by letting go? It is here that God plays a central role. Belief in God reminds us that every moment God has given us is precious. Hold on. In the same breath, belief in God reminds us that when the experience leaves us, all is not bad. In Milton Steinberg's words, you ready? The beauty of the world, its sunrise and sunset, the music of a symphony orchestra, orchestra, the smile of a child, the dreams of a loving couple, the wisdom of an older adult will be placed in God's trust who stands behind us all. There is pain in termination, but no anxiety. When these experiences leave us, they will be given to someone more wise, more beautiful, more blessed. That's spirituality. Be in the moment while feeling God's presence. And my sense is that we as Rabbanim, as spiritual leaders, men and women, who are trying as best as we can with great humility, always with great humility, to spiritually inspire, it's up to us to create those spiritual moments on the Yamin Nora'in. People are searching. There are those who say that people are not looking for God, not looking for spirituality. I tell you, people are searching for meaning, for God, for spiritual striving. And creating these spiritual moments of consciousness, consciousness of moment while feeling the presence of God. Not easy to do because often people are very uncomfortable in their own bodies, in their own skins. People are uncomfortable in the moment. But that's the challenge of spirituality. So I'd like to offer some examples of creating the spiritual moment. If you'll be kind enough to turn to page 19. I want to talk for a moment about Yiskor. Yiskor is always a central piece of the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur Davni. Part of Yiskor, as we mourn, has something to do with the art of coping. After my mother died, I stood up in front of my wonderful bayit and I apologized. It goes back many years and I said, you know, I always thought my, that my role as a rabbi was when there was pain and darkness, I would remove the pain and recite the abracadabra and there'd be no more darkness. Now that my mother has died, I want to apologize. Can you ever remove the darkness of the loss of a mother? And so this is this little midrash, which I wrote. This is what death and bereavement and being comforted is about. Mashallah Mahadaba Domea. 
ונתקל בכל מיני דברים שמבוזרים בתוך החדר. בכל פעם שנכנס לחדר הוא לומד יותר ויותר בדיוק איפה הדברים נמצאים, וכך נתקל בהם פחות ופחות. עד שאחרי זמן מה הוא מכיר את המקום היטב ולא נתקל בשום דבר למרות שהחדר עדיין חשוך. כמו כן המוות, יש חושך במוות שאי אפשר לגרשו, אבל אפשר ללמוד איך להמשיך לחיות למרות החושך הזה. To what can death be compared to a person who enters a darkened room for the first time and trips over the furniture? Each time he enters the room, he learns more and more where the furniture stands. In time, he or she becomes familiar with the room and despite the darkness, knows how to get around. So to death, there is darkness and death that cannot be chased away. But it is possible to learn how to continue to live despite the darkness, which forever remains. Look at the words of Leonard Cohen, four of his best lines. Ring the bell. that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. A spiritual moment for Yisgar. Paint this kind of picture, an image that speaks about Yisgar not as a monologue, but speaks of the memorial prayer as a dialogue. The doors open and soul, souls enter. It's like the Rav Nachman parable of the bridge over a pond and souls metaphysically make their way across and they connect to the physical beings that human beings are all about. And the souls enter. We ask our congregants, close your eyes for a moment. Imagine the person for whom you're reciting ye score before you. Imagine that moment. Try to feel the touch and the embrace, even though at this moment it may not be a physical one. Close your eyes tight. Can you think of a beautiful moment? This is not a time for negativity and bad moments. A beautiful, positive, positive moment. Can you hold on to that moment? Close your eyes even tighter. Can you think of a teaching? a teaching from mom, from dad, from a beloved that you want to incorporate into one's life, creating a spiritual moment. Or farewell moments, last moments, are very, very powerful moments. How does one say farewell? Imagine this Rosh Hashanah. Instead of beginning our service with the Baruch Hu, imagine going back to the last words that we say in 5,772. The last words. What would the last word be? Look at what Shlomo writes about saying farewell. He says, do you know the way they walk back from the holy wall? You don't turn around and walk away. When you meet the Tsar of Russia, you don't turn around and walk away. You walk backwards. And I want to bless you when your children grow up and they walk out of your house and they build their own houses. Say it enough. A lot of children turn around and they don't build a Jewish house anymore. I want to bless you. Your children should walk away backwards. My kids, when they were younger, went on strike. Shabbat night, they said, we just said Shalom Aleichem. Now we're going to say Tzaytchem Shalom. And they didn't sing Tzaytchem Shalom. I looked into it and I found out that Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Cohen Cook, this saintly rabbi, first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of Israel before it was officially a state, in his Bekesha, he would get up on Friday night and when he would get to Tzetchem the Shalom, he would go to the door, open the door, and wave bye-bye. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this at shul, and at that moment in our shul, people are open to, to respond as, as the rabbi or rabbis talk. Uh, so Daniela Grunfeld, she stood up and says, Rabbi, I have to tell you that when my children was young, were younger, and I would take them to the bus, and I would say goodbye as they'd go off to school. Instead of waving bye-bye this way, I'd wave bye-bye this way. How do you say goodbye to 5,772? It's a moment to create the last Olenu, the last, the last 
Kaddish, walking backwards. Tashlich, what a glorious moment. Taking people to the water. Why do we do this on Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah is the birth of the world. The world, Ruach Elohim, Rachevet Alpanei Hamayim. The Spirit of God hovered on the face of the, of the waters, bringing people to the waters. What a moment of reenacting God's creation of thinking and talking and living and breathing the environment. Or imagine creating a spiritual moment before we hear that first blast of the shofar. Or maybe it should be right before that last kiyagidola, that blast of redemption. Here's a thought. At that last kiyagidola, once again, try to freeze time even as it moves on. Close eyes, Rav Nachman says. It's at this moment of Tkiyagidola as Yom Kippur ends that the heavens are especially open. Can you picture in your heart and soul those who are closest to you, every child, every sibling, every spouse, every partner, every, every friend, and right before that blast, say the prayer. May my father be well. He's 93 and getting on in years, but I always loved hearing my father's children. This is one of my father's stories. This is one of my father, one of my favorite. He tells the story of a, um, of a poor person who comes from the Altaheim from Europe. And the poor person comes to America and is doing very, very well, extremely well and is now marrying off his youngest child, his youngest daughter. And in the middle of the chuppah, this person begins calling out, first mumbling, but then calling out in Yiddish, give me a nuggle, give me a nuggle. In Hebrew, tenli masner, give me a nail. Now by this time he had become one of the most important people in town. People had thought maybe he had gone mad. What is he talking about? So after the chuppah, they came up to him and said, what were you doing? What were you asking for? Under the chuppah, for a nail? And I could see my father telling me this story when I was a young boy. So the man said as follows, life is like a wheel. And sometimes the wheel reaches bottom and then it ascends. When I came to this country from Europe, I had nothing. My wheel was at the lowest point it could be. And here I am, marrying off my last child, and the wheel has ascended, and it's at its apex, it at its top. I realize it's a wheel. So under that chuppah, I was saying a prayer. Dear God, give me a knuckle. Give me a nail. Let me take the nail and drive it into the wheel. So just for now, for a few long moments, the wheel could hold and stop, and I could feel the moment so absolutely, completely. If you'll turn to page 20, in honor of Matt Fenster, blessed memory, who was a member of my dear colleague, Rabbi Barry Dove, Katz's conservative synagogue, he died a very young man. Read through this, Psalm 23. He spent the last years of his life, I don't think he reached 45, and he offered his commentary on Mizmor de David Hashem Rohi Lo Echsar. Talk about holding on to the moment. God is my shepherd, I shall not lack. The italics are his commentary. I never have lacked. I'd be so blessed to recognize those blessings. I've never lacked. In lush meadows, he lays me down. Beside tranquil waters, he leads me. This year, I've been able to feel a peace that I had not previously known in Hebrew, Nachad Ruach. He restores my soul. He writes knowing he was dying, which I believe is eternal. He leads me on paths of justice for his name's sake. I can only hope that I have followed these paths more often than I have shunned them. Gam kelech b'geit samavet. Lo time throughout this ordeal. I've never been afraid. Perhaps it's because I'm a person of faith. 
Or maybe I am too simple-minded to recognize the magnitude of the loss that I am facing. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I interpret God's rod and staff to be my family, my friends, respectively. You prepare a table before me in view of my tormentors. I think about the tables of my life. My childhood dinner table, breakfast before school with my kids at a cafe table, a cinder table, the table from which I read the Torah in synagogue. Dishanta Bashem and Roshi, I was brought up to believe I was special and could accomplish anything that I wanted. My cup overflows, a phrase I have uttered to myself each Friday night before the words of Kiddush. May only goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of God for eternity. Although I am saddened by what I miss, the days with which I have been blessed have been full. So I bless you and I ask you to bless me as we prepare ourselves for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that we really feel the prayer of Nafal, we feel the presence of God, that we feel the presence of each other, that we be able, O oh God, to face each other face to face, and we not only not be alone, but that we not be lonely and that we be able to live in the spiritual moment, to hold on to the moment. Recognize that I've got to hold it loosely, but to hold it, hold it. It's a moment that I'll never, never have back. A final story, I turned to my Abba as I do every year, and I said, Abba, I'm about ready to, to give this uh, high holiday uh, sermon seminar, and um, Saba so always says, well, did you prepare? <laughs> I always tell my students, always tell my students that it's okay to be off. We're all off. We all have our moments. But the one thing that's inexcusable is never get up unprepared. Because if you're unprepared and winging it, I tell them, and I tell myself, it shows a lack of, of respect for the people, honored people we're speaking to. And I'm not embarrassed to say that I worked for, not hours, for days on uh, today's sessions because I, I, I felt so uplifted preparing and so uplifted sharing with you. I wanted to, uh, to, to apologize. I don't like sharing frontly. I much rather give and take, but doing, uh, doing this elsewhere, I've come to understand that to time, that's what I've been asked to do, to share frontly, so please excuse me for that. So when I told my father, I prepared, I said, Abba, do you have a story? So this is the story he told me. And with this I close and, and wish you a Shana Tova Mituka. He said once there was a town in a lot of, a lot of trouble, and uh, so they decided that they were gonna hire a, a kind of a, a Heston type of actor who would come in and everybody would gather in their small little synagogue, a couple hundred people, was relatively small, and uh, the actor would come forward and would read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he leadeth me down, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But they didn't want the elderly rabbi to feel bad. So they went up to the rabbi and they said, um, a Rabbi, uh, this is what we're doing, and we'll allow you after the actor is finished you can come up and you could speak, but we want to control your speaking. You can only recite the Dabr Hashem, the Dabr Hashem, you can only recite the Lord is my, the Dabr Mizma Hashem Roi, you can only recite the Lord is my shepherd. Actor gets up on that night and he is absolutely brilliant. His, his, uh, his diction, his framing, his syntax, his structure, his inflections, he was absolutely, completely all there. He read it magnificently. And when he finished, he actually received a standing ovation. Then Nebuch, the rabbi, gets up. <laughs> and the rabbi, David, Mizmo, Hashem, Rawi, And as he speaks, he just internalizes it so powerfully. And he breaks down. And after he breaks down, sure enough, people in the audience were so touched. If you're touched, it's contagious. 
people were touched and they broke down and, and they cried. And he sat down quietly, no standing ovation, but goodness how he touched deeply, deeply souls of others. And so afterwards they went up to the actor and they said, uh, Herr Actor, Mr. Actor, you know, you read beautifully, really beautifully. But the rabbi, the truth of the matter is, this elderly rabbi, he outdid you. How is that possible? And the actor said, I'll tell you, when you asked me to read the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I memorized every word. I went over and over it very carefully and I delivered it in perfect timing. I delivered the 23rd Psalm. But this rabbi, this rabbi knows the shepherd. <laughs> he knows the shepherd. May we know the shepherd for many, many years to come. Shana Tova, Mutsukha.